Good evening and welcome to our Waltham Public Library program, Writing Fiction with One City, One Story author, Chandra Lahiri. My name is Deborah Hoffman and I organize programs and events for the library. Thanks for tuning in. Before we start, I wanna let you know how the evening will go. Our speaker will introduce the story and then I'll be interviewing her after which she'll field questions from you. To ask questions via the chat function, use a Google account to sign into YouTube. Feel free to write your questions at any time and then I'll read them at the end of the presentation. Chandra Lahiri was born in Kolkata, India, but spent parts of her childhood in Africa and various parts of the Middle East before returning to the homeland in her teens. She moved to America for a graduate degree in geography that led to a 25 year career in GIS for environmental management. She lives in Waltham with her husband and 14 year old son who often provides fodder for her stories. Over the years, she has scratched her itch for writing in the thin slivers of free time that exist in the life of a working mother. This has taken the form of blogging, running flash fiction groups, curating a children's magazine for her son, entering contests, and participating in public storytelling in the tradition of the moth. Welcome, Chandra Lahiri. We're so happy to host you. Thank you so much, Deb Deborah. That's lovely to be here. So do you want to talk about uh, One City, One Story and your story sure. that won the award? Yes, I'd love to. Um, so One City, One Story is this amazing contest that the Boston Book Fest runs. The Boston Book Festival is a literary festival come book fair like uh, a lot of cities have. Um, and a lot of cities have this thing called the One City Read, where the whole city picks a book and then they read it together. And then book clubs and panels like this happen. It's a, it's a way to promote literature and reading and understanding. The Boston Book Festival went a step further because there was such a vibrant literary community here, so many great writers. They started hosting a contest where established writers send in short stories and one gets selected, which I'm just really, really honored that I was that person this year. And what they did is they took my short story, they printed it into these little booklets and uh, they printed 20,000 of them. Uh, it's also online, translated into numerous five or six different languages. And yeah, it's a, it's a chance for Boston and the greater Boston area to actually come together and uh, discuss their love for literature and stepping into other worlds, which is what fiction does. Um, so that's how that happened um, about my story. So my story is called Dumbachora, which Dumbachora is actually a real place People who've already read the story who may have already picked up one of these books from the library or, or any place else in Waltham. It's in many places. Um, Dumbachora, um, I'm gonna quickly tell you the origin story because it is kind of different. My cousin, whose name is Hoimunti, she lives in Kolkata, India, and she loves traveling. She loves nature. She and her husband are always traveling all over the country. About 10 years ago on Facebook, Koimanti Banerjee had put up a bunch of these absolutely amazing photographs of this beautiful wooden boat. The sun was going down. There was water glimmering in the distance. There were sandbars. And it was a whole slew of these. And it was only captioned, Dumbajara. So I messaged her to say, what is the deal? What is this? Tell me what this is. It's so, it's haunting. And then she told me. They were in the Sundarbans, which is this mangrove forest, this beautiful part of the delta of the Ganges, very close to Kolkata. And they travel there often. It's the home of the Royal Bengal Tiger. So they're always going there on trips to ride. It's just, it's just a beautiful area and to see if they can sight a tiger. And on one of those trips, their boat, it, it's, a, it's an estuary. Uh, it's a delta, but it's estuarine. So the tide, the difference in tides is huge. The tide went up and their boat got stuck on a tide on a sandbar. And there it was. I saw the pictures and I said, oh, my goodness, we must write a story about this. So, And you did. <laughs> I, and so did she. And in fact, this aunt of mine, Shujata, I pulled her in. I said, look at this picture. 
we can't let this go by. So the three of us, I set a deadline because I, 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 I like running flash fiction uh, groups. And I said, come on, two weeks, everybody write a story. It's too romantic. So neither of them really bit very hard. But I wrote the story and here we are 10 years later. And I'm just so thrilled that so much of Boston is getting to read this. And it's, it's about a Bengali couple. I'm Bengali, which means from the West Bengal, the state of West Bengal in Eastern India. Um, the capital of witches, Kolkata, which used to be called Calcutta. So yeah, I'm just, I'm delighted that such small events would lead to something like this, where thousands and thousands of people now actually know the name. And it's, it's delightful, as you can tell, I'm really happy about it. So exciting. And so exciting for Waltham in particular. Um, I'm so excited that they're calling me the Waltham author everywhere. Um, and <laughs> I love it. Oh, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Well, we are so happy uh, to have you here tonight. Um, I have some questions for you that the audience might be interested in hearing your answers to. Um, you're not a trained writer, but how did you develop your writing skills? Um, so I'm not trained. My day job is I work for the Department of Conservation and Recreation as a GIS specialist. My advanced degrees are in geography and GIS. Um, I've always liked to write. I read a lot. I never actually did much writing until my son was very little. He was about two when we moved to Waltham. And right around that time, I started writing children's stories. And I really just started writing. I think for, I'm starting to understand now, I, I have, I should uh, I should confess that I have been bitten very hard by imposter syndrome, where, you know, one feels like one's not quite everything that they're being advertised to be. That This is a really huge honor. And previous authors who have won have been Pulitzer Prize winning authors. And I really feel like I don't know how I snuck in there. But I'm starting to gain some respect for the fact that you don't need advanced degrees to be a writer, to to have a way with words. And I think the way I, uh, the way it happened for me is I started exactly like you said in your introduction, I started to find slivers of time in which I could write. And I had to make excuses and create situations for myself because if I just said, oh, let me sit down with a blank piece of paper and a pen, nothing would come out. Mm. Or what would come out would be never ending and not go anywhere. I think we've all, all had this happen. So I did a lot of little things. My son would love stories. So the stories I told him, I would serialize them and I would mm. write a new chapter every day. I would tell a new chapter, then I'd go write it down. Because a, a, a little child is the best audience, you know, big wide eyes, yeah. gasps, tell me more, demands, no tomorrow, the character must do that. Sure. All right, kid. <laughs> so it started like that. Um, I, I convened a flash fiction club of my friends on Facebook. I would throw out prompts and we would do timed writing. I did that. I started blogging because having a small child is just endless entertainment. So I started writing a blog. Um I started writing short stories that I entered in contests. I started doing storytelling in the tradition of the moth. I've been on a number of shows now. I produce and curate my own shows. I basically found little goals to help me write. And my aim was that I, if I think about what makes someone a writer, it's a unique voice, right? Like mm -hmm. when you pick up a book, by a certain person, they have a unique way with words, they have a unique perspective. They just have their own way of stringing things together. And I knew that that wouldn't be something, it, it's not like turning on a switch, right? You can't flip a switch and make that happen. So I just made opportunities for myself to write, 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 and discover what is, what is it that's uniquely me? What is my style of writing? And I'm still discovering, but I'm getting a little bit better with practice now. Cool. That, that's a really cool story. Um, how do you pick the settings for your stories? Um, I am not, I haven't yet reached the point where I can write one big novel. Hopefully I'll do that one day. Right now it's almost the reverse. The setting drives the story. Uh, all, most of my stories are prompt based. So like this one, I saw the setting first and then the story came. But uh, I'm part of a flash fiction group right now where every day I have to write a story and submit it. 
and you know we keep each other accountable and the setting doesn't come first the prompt is just a word or a phrase or a sentence so i think the way i find my settings is um because i'm doing timed writing because i'm saying okay today's my deadline i have 20 minutes to write this or 12 minutes to write this i kind of empty my head and i just let it come out and it's a wonderfully cathartic untraditional way of writing but what happens is that the things that are on my mind kind of drive the story it's really funny that I don't know anything about the character I'm going to write about until I start typing or until I start writing Uh, you know an image will pop into my head Uh, the story I wrote today is about a homeless person because of the cleanup they had on Methadone Mile in Boston and the picture that popped up was one of those ragged tents and my prompt had nothing to do with that but it's what was bubbling in my head I've really been struggling with the ethics and the political conundrum of that and that was the setting and that was the story that came out and I wrote for 15 minutes and I had a short story at the end of it and I've gone ahead and submitted it. So my setting comes from my life. It comes from things that are bubbling in my head. And like I said, I, I, I encourage everyone to try this. It's like therapy. I don't even realize what I'm thinking about until I've written the story and I'm like, oh, huh, okay. It's all, it almost sounds like journaling except in a story format. I think it's exactly that, except, yeah, it's even more stream of consciousness and subconscious because it's not like I set out to document my day or I don't make a conscious effort to sift through my brain to say, "Hmm, what matters to me? What do I want to write about? That's what's wonderful about the prompt is the prompt said something. Today's prompt said, um, I've already been sick three times this month and I'm soaked now. That was the prompt. And I was like, what, what do you do with that? Yes. Someone's been sick three times and they are soaking wet right now. Okay. And then you just kind of empty your mind. And then the first thing that popped into my mind right now, again, like I said, right, if the methadone mile news piece hadn't been simmering, it may have gone somewhere completely different. It could have been a kid lost in the woods, or it could be I'm out for a hike and I, 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 I didn't bring my raincoat or I don't the doorbell rings and come out of the shower who knows what the setting would have been right right that's a fascinating process what's your favorite thing about writing fiction if if you have a favorite well I think I just talked about one this cathartic value of mining my uh not just what I'm thinking of but then delving into my imagination so yeah my favorite part would be walking in the shoes of someone I'll never be. Mm. And so I, I don't claim to know what goes through the mind of someone who's found themselves in such difficult straits in life that they're living on a tent on the street, but the ability to empathize and not, not appropriate their story, but try to really understand, to read, to research, to put myself in situations, and then to populate that story with details that I pull from what must be observations from real life, right? When you describe a certain person, that person's usually an amalgam of all the different people like that that you've seen before. When you describe some nuance of the behavior, I've seen it before, or I've read about it before, or I've watched it in a film, and it's gone, you know, everything just builds up inside your mind, and this is a chance to let it lose without even consciously doing it. I'll read it later, and I'll be like, ooh, oh, I bet I know where that came from. It's not not by design. So I think that's my favorite part is being who I'm not, um, living a life that I don't know or living a life that I know and using poetic license or creative license because that's not my life. I can now tell it the way I think it should have been or or explore some other theme and start with something that really happened and turn it into something completely crazy. So that, that kind of freedom to create is quite heady yes yes um why why do you write and uh moreover why should anyone write yeah um so the first question is very personal why do i write and i think this is great because we're we're segueing into these i I write because it's cathartic I, i i write because i love creating 
I love creating something that didn't exist before. And um, it's a place to put my observations and my thoughts. You mentioned journaling. I'm sure that's what journaling's look like. I think the closest I've come to that is blogging, and that wasn't daily. But um, I love being able to, you know, that there's so much stimulus in this world. There's so much that you think about as you go through the grind and things unfold, unfold around you in public affair, public events, and um, I mean current affairs my family back home, all the stresses and strains and joys and wonderful experiences of life. Um, it's a place to put them instead of having them trapped in my head. And uh, journaling would be documenting, chronicling it A to Z. Creative writing is taking a nugget of something that really touched you and explore it, explore it, explore it. So in the story, in my One City, One Story, Dumbachora, some of the themes that I, that must have been filtering in my mind at the time I wrote it, I don't know, um, must have been about loneliness, isolation, um, strained marriages, the nature of how tricky communication can be, how, how landmined it is until you get it just right. Um, environmental challenges. I work in environmental management, so those were always top, topmost in my mind. So I feel like it's a license to be able to explore all this and put your thoughts in a cogent way and write something that maybe touches someone. If I could give you a lecture today on why the environment in the Sundarbans is so threatening now, I could give my son a lecture about the value of communications. I'm not sure it would be as effective as a short story that punches him in the guts, you know? So that's, it's good communication. And why anyone else should uh, write? Well, like you were saying, maybe my, my methods are a little strange and a little non-traditional. I think people should write for catharsis. It's awesome. When you write a journal or a blog, especially if you're writing about other people, it, you get so tense. You don't want to hurt anyone. You don't want to reveal too much. If it's fiction, all bets are off. It's not you. It's not them. You get to really explore and you get to vent and put it on someone else. Explore it. And sometimes writing a story will help me figure out how I really feel. I wouldn't have known until I've written it. And I'll work it out while I'm writing. At the end of it, I'll be like, wow, that ended way more positively than I started. I, and then I walk away with hope. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I've just done it all to myself. It's been, I, I psychoanalyze myself or something. <laughs> it sounds like you surprise yourself often. Always, yeah. Not always in good ways. Um, for every one good story I write, there's three that are in. Yeah. <laughs> um. Would you like to read an excerpt from the story? I would, yeah. In fact, I'm going to read, a, it's really just two pages. Oh, no. Yeah. From kind of the part that leads up to the climax. If, if, um, if people haven't, if some of the audience haven't read it before, I don't think there's a spoiler here. But the setup to this is just that there is a couple who were on, a, it, it's like my origin story. They were on a boat that was on this beautiful Deltaic River. The tide went out, they're marooned on a little sandbar. The Sundarban forests are nearby, populated by the tiger and they're stuck and it's cold and they're newly married. And their names are Shikhar and Shutapa, the husband's Shikhar and the woman's Shutapa. A loud, Oh, sorry. A low, loud, whooping beat punctured the silence that had sunk between them, weighted by confession and the poundage of their entire future. It came from a luminous white heron, gliding a lazy path across their view of the jungle as it headed towards the horizon, just about where the sun had finally sunk. Shikor silently tracked its flight. You knew and still agreed to this arranged marriage? She asked him softly. We all have past Shutupa. They can be hard to leave behind. That's the reason I've, I have not tried to get intimate with you these past three months that we've been married. These things take time, said Shekhar in a carefully measured voice, his back still turned to her. 
Same old story then, isn't it? Her voice was now strong and challenging, her gaze clear again, unmarred by the sudden tears that she angrily brushed away. She did not mean to apologize or slip into a martyr's meek shoes just because she was a woman who had dared to follow her heart. I didn't have you down as a conservative hypocrite shaker. One set of rules for women, men and another for women. By loving you once, but by loving once, even if it was a mistake, I have given up all rights of loving you, right? Right? She flared up, defiance back in full measure as she violent, violently yanked his arm from behind to turn him around. She would make him face her and their life. The unexpected force and Shaker's precarious perch on the boat's prow proved unequal to his balance. He windmilled his arms a few times in search of it, then silently toppled over the side of the boat and disappeared. And I think I'll, I'll end it right there. I love that scene. <laughs> and there's so much in it, uh, so much about their relationship, about them as individuals, yeah. and then this you know, surprise fall. Um, yeah, and then things get, Things don't go very well for Shikla right after that point. It, <laughs> um, so it's almost like the catalyst that makes everything happen is her getting, yeah. Um, would you like me to talk about this scene at all or? Sure, sure, that would well, be great. Actually, I'm curious, Deborah, when you read it, what did you think? Well, what were some questions in your mind when you read it? Um, well, I loved the story. Um, I, one of the things that really appealed to me was just the, the tension between the two newlyweds and their, um, you know, you find out it's an arranged marriage um, and that there are some definite feelings about that. Um, and actually in your story, they, uh, they have an argument, um, which you've, you've read about, um, and I was wondering if you could talk more about that. Yeah, sure. So um, thank you, first of all, thank you for reading it and liking it. I'm so happy to hear that. Um, so because I didn't, I, did, I wanted to write a short story and I didn't want to get into this long discussion. So I wanted to just touch on some themes and hear what I was talking about. The, I mean, first of all, this whole concept of an arranged marriage. A lot of Americans are not even aware of what that is what's arranged about a marriage. And a lot of them, when they know about it, know of a very stereotypical old fashioned way. Actually, my parents had an arranged marriage. That's where the two families decide that these people will marry and they get married. And it's an alien concept here because back in the day, even my, my family, my parents lived in what's called a joint family, which again is an alien idea here. But until quite recently, a lot of Bengali families uh, our families all over India lived in these arranged, uh, in these uh, joint families where traditionally when your son gets married, he lives, he, he, he brings his wife home to his parents. They all live together. It's his responsibility to take care of his parents. The woman actually goes to the, her husband's house. She leaves her home, but she moves in with her husband and her uh, parents. Very often there's aunts and uncles. Um, my joint family had my father's brother and his family, his old, his um, mom on the floor above us was his uncle and his entire family. And it was all, it was one apartment. So everyone lives all together. So the thing that a lot of, uh, the, the cultural chasm that many people don't get is when people don't always marry for their own sake, they marry for their family. Uh, your wife will come home and she will take care of everything. She'll cook, she'll clean, she'll take care of your elder, elderly parents, she'll take care of them. Now that landscape has changed a lot in India, right? A lot of women work. Uh, a lot of joint families have converted into nuclear families. So we call them nuclear families. Um, so, and there's a lot more agency. A lot, more and more people have these love marriages. It's actually called love, where you pick your own partner. <laughs> and so that that's kind of how the cultural standards are shifting, have shifted. The, the other disclaimer about this story is that I came to the U.S. 
25, 26 years ago. So culture does not stand still. Indian culture has evolved significantly over the last few decades. So I'm describing a culture that I knew then. My, you know, I go, I visit India and I'm still in touch with the culture, but I don't pretend to know it as well as I did back then. What I can tell now is women are so much more empowered. There are still pockets of conservative society where there are arranged marriages, but it has changed a lot now. Now, what was happening between the two of them? You know, when she says, oh, it's okay for you to have girlfriends, but if I had a boyfriend before, that means you're not going to touch me or be intimate with me. That means you didn't, you don't really love me. You said, why'd you marry me? You know, that kind of a thing. She instantly jumps to that conclusion because that used to be one of those uh, hypocrisies, right? That Mm -hmm. a woman must be chaste. I think it was similar in American society too, to a certain point, but a man has a lot more license. The other thing that he uh, mentions is something called a caste bias. So in a lot of Indian families, you're expected to marry into the same caste as you, which in Hinduism, you have different castes of whom Brahmins are supposedly the highest. And so you don't marry out of caste. And in their particular situation, what I allude to in the story is Shutapa uh, was in love with this guy called Manoj Bhagji, who was a different caste. Mm. And um, his family was not happy with the match because she was a different caste and he couldn't stand up to his parents. So he walked out on her, right? So that's kind of like the crux of it. And so I think in the story, Shutapa is kind of scarred. She's this woman who's trying to find her own feet. She's obviously a strong woman. Um, Shekhar also, I allude to the fact that he's had this arranged marriage, but he's not, he's a little bit embarrassed about it because anyone who's modern, you know, it's kind of embarrassing to have your parents have found someone for you, but he's kind of happy about it too. I mean, he was lonely. Nothing was happening. Why not? You know? Right. Um, so, so they're both in this very, they're both in very uh, unsteady, they're both on unsteady grounds. Mm. Him because he's, he's kind of happy about this woman and he's in love with her, but he's very surprised that his life has turned out the way it has. And her because she thinks that he's rejecting her because of her past. And she thinks, oh my God, I ended up with another chauvinist pig. This is what happened to my life. And she's trying to stand up to say, no, you talk it out with me. So it's, there's, there's a lot happening there, like you said. Yeah. Uh, it, it's amazing actually how much can happen in such a short story. Um, and you're, you're so good at, uh, sort of painting that picture without using a lot of words. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm glad that came through. I, I hope some people are catching on to what was actually going on. And I've loved a lot of, a lot of readers are making their own guesses. And I, it's been really fun to hear them because all of them could be true. I don't know. This is, this is the beautiful thing about fiction too, is that Shutapa and Shekhar are imaginary. So your Shikor and Shutapa could very well be doing the things that you think they're doing. It's up to you. Right, right. That's the beauty of fiction. Um, can you tell us about other things that you've written? Um, sure. I, I write a lot of short fiction and what's called flash fiction. Micro, micro fiction is something I've been playing with. 100 word short stories, 200 word stories. Um, I've written a lot. <laughs> Um, I have not yet been published. I'm really hoping that I meet an agent or a publisher. I've got an anthology of short stories that I would love to publish uh, about all sorts of different topics, uh, a lot that have immigrant characters, a lot that have American characters. One character has an American character in in Haiti. So uh, Mm. I I tend to be all over the place. I also, um, I've had a a non-traditional kind of... um, childhood where I, I was born in India, but I grew up in Africa and various countries of the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and then I came back to India as a teenager. Um, so I have, I've been through my blog and then through my storytelling, I've been doing a lot of, I think they call it narrative nonfiction, but really memoir. Mm. So I have a lot of that writing. I do a lot of storytelling. So I consider that to be writing too. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the stories that I, I, I'm 
fondest of is on a show called Stories from the Stage that's mm -hmm. on, um, on Mondays on the World Channel. And I was lucky to be cast in one of the shows. And I spoke about an incident when I was six years old in, um, in Qatar. And interestingly enough, I spoke only Bengali at that point and no English. And mm -hmm. a series of events that happened to me as a little girl. It was just a, it's a little moment in time, nothing big. So I'm very fond of that. Uh, last year, I actually participated in a very cool contest, which I hope everyone will participate in, called Boston in 100 Words, mm -hmm. which is awesome. I would love it if Waltham became part of it someday. Um, it's a contest where you have to submit 100 word stories. You have to either live or work in Boston. I qualified because I work downtown or in a bunch of surrounding cities. Waltham well, isn't part of it, but Watertown is. Um, and if you qualify, then you put in your 100 word story. And if you win, I wasn't one of the top three winners, but I was one of the honorable mentions. And what they do is they commission original art interpreting your 100 word story. And actually, that's it on the wall right there. My story was about seeing jellyfish and the Charles. They turned them into, that's a small poster, but they turned them into these humongous hoardings and they plaster hundreds and hundreds of them throughout the subway system. So until a month ago, if you went to South Station or Government Center, my story was up there. Uh, about jellyfish and the Charles. Uh -huh. a new, the new contest has started, just finished this year, so a new bunch of them are out. They're inside the train cars, and the idea, similar to One City, One Story, which is free, the idea is to bring literature to people yeah. instead of having people to promote the love of reading. This is even cooler where it attacks people when they don't even know it's coming. Yeah. So you're hanging onto your strap and in the car, and you know where the ads are? Yeah. that you just glaze out, you, your eyes glaze over, yeah. suddenly you start reading it and it's a story. And, yeah. a and because they're all from the Boston, they're all based in Boston, you identify landmarks. Yes. Or you're waiting for your train on the platform and there's a Nike ad and there's Mass General Hospital and there's a story and there's a beautiful picture. So it was so much fun. I was so thrilled yeah. to be part of that. And because, and interestingly, a lot of people had no idea this jellyfish and the Charles. Neither did I until the day I saw it. That's my story. Yeah, yeah. I love that form of public art, you know, art and literature mm -hmm. together. Um, I agree. I, yeah, I, I haven't seen that. I, you know, I used to ride the teal up, but not so much anymore. So um, sure, yeah. I'll have to look the next time. Uh, it's a really cool concept. And interestingly, that's not fiction. That's nonfiction. So it's in the realm of storytelling again, of telling okay. true stories. It actually started from a program in Santiago in Chile. And it was intended to not just promote the love of reading and writing, but to let people understand who's in the city, who makes up your city. So not every story is the same. You have people from all different socioeconomic groups, uh, different experiences, it, empathy, and it builds community. It really makes you feel like you're part of something. Yeah, yeah. Very, very cool concept. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your storytelling efforts, um, particularly what you're doing right here in Waltham? Oh, I would love to. Thank you. So um, because I've been doing a lot of storytelling, I, over the years, and particularly during the pandemic, um, I had the idea of starting a storytelling show for Waltham. And I have started it. It's called We Are Waltham. And my intention, my goal, my deeply held uh, wish is that this becomes a periodic show where anyone and everyone in Waltham will be able to step up and stare, share a story from their lives and share it with everyone else. So that similar to what I was saying about the uh, stories in the tea, we start getting an idea of who Waltham is. Mm -hmm. um, I love Waltham, it's been my home for 12 years and I've mm -hmm. felt a kind of belonging here that I haven't even felt in Kolkata because as, as I told you, I've grown up all over the world. This is the community that I've felt has held me, my husband, my son as their own. Um, mm -hmm. And I've been very dismayed to see how divided we are. And I'm not naive. Of course, every community is divided. 
there's no utopia, but there's so much energy and spirit and um, and just diversity in the city. I would love to be able to share that with everyone. And by that, I don't just mean st sharing the story of immigrants, sharing the story of everybody who makes up this city. Um, we have been given a home at the Charles River Museum of Industry and Innovation. So starting next year, fingers crossed, we're gonna have four shows there, one every quarter on the stage there. In between, our first show was at Riverfest this summer. So I had six to eight tellers and we told all sorts of stories. A bunch of people came. It was wonderful. I'm hoping to have more shows at festivals like that. I'm hoping to hold monthly story meets where if anybody has an idea, it has to be a five minute story. It's got to be true. It has to have happened to you. Please email me. Of course, every show that we have at the museum will only be six to eight people. So we're going to have to pick a few people, but we're hoping to keep it going, 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 going so that there'll always be a show that you can tell your story on, or there'll be a, a local festival you can tell your story on, or maybe we'll even have a website where if you're not yet comfortable about going on the stage or at a festival, record it and we'll stick it on the website. So I'm really excited about this. Um, is it okay if I share the email for anyone who might be listening? Yes, absolutely. Wonderful. So it's we are Waltham, those words all run together at gmail.com. Excellent. Excellent. So, I love that. And Deborah, if you know of anyone who's had, it doesn't even have to have been an interesting life. The best stories are not that adventurous. It's not always about a tiger almost eating you up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm writing down that email right now. We are Waltham at gmail.com. That's right. And I'm, um, I'm trying to get a website set up. Um, I might just add it to my website for now. Um, which is my first name, last name dot com. But if if people email me at that Gmail I, ID, um, I'm I'm going to be providing coaching help. So it's not like they have to come to me with a full story. In fact, I, I co-produce another storytelling show called Voices for South Asian South Asian Immigrants. And one of the things I do is I sniff out stories. So if somebody kind of thinks they have a story. I'll have a conversation with them and I'll be able to say, oh, it sounds like you've got three stories here. Which one would you like to tell? And then I hope people craft their stories. So they're not alone. If you even think you have the big idea of a story, talk to me, or I might invite you to one of those monthly small group Zoom meeting where it's a safe environment and we'll all just share our stories, maybe pour a glass of wine and see what comes out. Wow, that's so cool. Um... I mean, it sounds like basically the moth for Waltham. I, I, I don't want to, uh, it, that's way above my league, but yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's see if uh, we have any questions for you from our viewers. Um, we have a couple of comments first. Um, so excited for this event. Um, thanks for hosting this event. Um, given your son as a source of inspiration, will you continue to write in the YA genre like you were writing in children's? Oh, unfortunately, my son has ceased to be my inspiration because he's in high school now and he wants very little to do with me. But that is a really, I appreciate that question because I have a couple of middle grade. I have one middle grade novel that's halfway written and I do actually have what might be a YA novel cooking, but um, I, I, I'm, it's kind of one of those things that are stuck. I would love to revive it one day. Mm. He's, he's a very good bouncing board. I run a lot of stories by him. Um, cool. He has uh, grown into a quiet, thoughtful teenager. Not as entertaining. Mm. <laughs> Great question. Um, given your flash fiction writing club, are you a fan of the National Novel Writing Month, which oh, we are in? We are in. I wish I was. One day I'm going to make myself do it. I don't have a novel idea. That's the thing. Um, 
And I know that I, I think this year caught me off guard. There's so much happening with the One City, One Story. Next year, I would love to do it just to get myself into a writing habit. Yeah. And it would be lovely to maybe we can coordinate and do something through the library where a bunch of us, the whole idea of it's called NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing Month, that you keep yourself uh, accountable. I will say that I'm doing something similar. I'm part of a daily flash group for the month of November where the person who runs it, every Friday, he gives us five prompts, one for each day of the week. And every day we have to write for 12 minutes or three, 350 words, whichever comes first. No, actually 350 words max. And then he pairs us up with another writer and we email each other our stories. And but the next day we provide critique. So I'm not doing NaNoWriMo, but I am doing something solid. So for the first time in my life, I'm writing every single day. And what's better is I'm critiquing someone else's writing, which really makes me think about language, appreciate idioms, just gets me waiting in the my head in the right space. It's been wonderful so far. Wow. And you do this in the evenings outside your work day? It, it's 12 minutes. Um, it's 12 minutes timed writing. So yeah, I usually do it after dinner. I get in my jammies, I get in bed in my day. Cool, cool. Um, given your advanced degree in geography, why is the notion of a mountain, uh, why is the notion of a mountain not yet well-defined? The definition of a mountain does not work on any topographical surface. And maybe you understand that better than I do. The definition of a mountain does not work on any topographical surface. Um, if they're talking about reading a map, uh, the actually mountain peaks, uh, first of all, I don't know which map they're referring to. If you look at the maps that the, United, the USGS, United States Geological Services, provides, um, the topographical maps have contours and mountain peaks are usually called out. There's usually a tiny little triangle symbol mm -hmm. and then next to it is the height of the peak. Um, I think the question might be why are some called out as a mountain and why are some that might be of a certain height not called out? Mm -hmm. I, I am not aware of why some are called out and some are not. Um, it, you'd have to talk to the USGS, uh, or I'm sure if you go to their website, they'll have, uh, they may have their assumptions. Um, but usually when it comes to reading a map, you look at how close together the contours are to see how steep, how what the gradient is, and you can read the markings to tell how high it is. I'm sorry, I don't have a very satisfactory answer on that. Okay. Um... Does the worry or interest in having children play into the story? And I, I guess uh, your your story. Um, I I think it. I think they're too early in their marriage to be thinking about that, don't you? Um, I wouldn't. There, my goodness, these these poor kids are lost to each other. They're not even. They have such a big gap between them. She's not even sure he loves her. He's not sure she loves him. Turns out they both are pretty happy to be with each other. Um, but they're both starting out on this tenuous journey. I hope kids are in their future if that's what they want. But uh, at this, at the point that I write this story, no, children, having children does not play into it in any way. It's a story about miscommunication. It just so happens to be in the context of a marriage in this story, but I think if you pick that up and place it somewhere else, it would apply, uh, it would apply equally. You could be paired up with a new work partner or be managing the, uh, a new team mm -hmm. and certain ways that someone behaves or the things that you know about them beforehand may make you jump to a conclusion or you might slot them into a stereotype and not because you're a jerk, but because this is what life teaches us, right? When we have met three people who act the same way, it's easy to assume that the fourth person will, or they fit the criteria. Um, and I think that's what I was really trying to, I, I hope some people caught on to that, that, you know, 
first impressions are not right. Your assumptions aren't always right. It's really important to communicate. And sometimes, like we said, it's not utopia. It takes for you to fall off the boat and almost get eaten <laughs> to be like, oh, that's what was happening. So sorry. <laughs> um, uh, and the final question for you from the audience, um, and I think you've touched on this a little, uh, ever thought or explored uh, long fiction, for example, a novel? I haven't, I'd love to. I, 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 don't, I, I don't know how other writers do it, but I imagine there has to be a story bubbling that you must tell, or a couple of characters or a situation that really grabs you and then maybe you're like, ooh, I need to see what happens next. Um, I've written lots and lots of stories so far, and they're very diverse characters, but none of them have come to haunt me yet. Mm. I think, um, I, I don't know, I'd, I'd love to learn more about writing one day so I can figure out or talk to more writers to know how they do it. How, how does it start, you know? Um, but yeah, no, no, no novel in me just now, but uh, there's a couple of stories that I've written in the last year that have, uh, that I keep coming back to. So I'm not sure. I think there might be something coming. Thank you so much for asking, for having the faith to even think that I'm capable of it. I would like to. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, yes. Great question. Um, we are... At 10 minutes of eight now, um, I think the original plan was that we would do a writing prompt, um, but I think we don't really have time for that tonight. Um, but I would like to invite everyone to join us um, December 15th, uh, when Chandra Lahiri will be with us again for a flash fiction writing um, workshop. Um, so any of you who are um, interested in finding out about what that process looks like and um, possibly sharing your work, um, I would encourage you to join us uh, then. Uh, that's Wednesday, December 15th at seven o'clock. Um, and I think unless there was anything else you wanted to say about writing or your story or... Um, uh, no, uh, the only thing is that um, this story is online in various translations. So I, I would love for the word to get out about it so more people could read and kind of go on this adventure in a different part of the world and in a different culture. Um, and then for the writing exercise that's coming up in December, on December 15th, um, I think the prompt, I, I might, I, I'm going to give a, uh, attendees a choice. They can either take a brand new prompt and I'll pull one out of my bag, or I think it might be really fun to use the prompt that's on the One City, One Story website. So if you Google One City, One Story, or if you go to my uh, page, which is my first name, chandrilary.com, it'll take you to the One City, One Story website. And they actually took a quote from my story. It's actually the very last line of my story. And they ran their own contest. And the per there was a winner and they, they said it had to be a 200 word story. And I think I'd like to use that same prompt. Uh, so the very last line of my story, you could use that and just let your mind go anywhere. You don't even have to use the words in that. Any thought that that inspires, it could be something related, non-related. Um, if you'd like to think about that, read that line again, empty your brain and see if something floats up. And if it does come right with us on December 15th. Great. And we also have a link to that contest um, in the YouTube description. Um, so Perfect. you can, you can um, click on it there. And if anybody else has questions or comments, um, you can email me through my website. Um, and if you'd like to get in touch about We Are Waltham, it's wearewaltham at gmail.com. I would love, I would love, love, love to get more stories from uh, Waltham residents out there. Thank you so much, Deborah. This has been really fun. And thank you all. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you all for tuning in tonight. Um, and have a good night. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.